Hey, you're live. Call the meeting order, please. You are welcome to approval of the agenda. I'm sorry, Greg, my microphone out here. Welcome to approval of March 1st, 2021, Soul Mill Company meeting. By Debbie, thanks by Wenda. Any questions, comments? All favor motion. Motion is carried. Is there any com conflicts or pecuniary interest for the general nature thereof? Show them none. The approval of the minutes of the February 16th, 2021 Stone, Stone Mill Breaker Council meeting. Move by Doug, second by Kevin. Any questions, comments? All in favor of the motion? Motion is carried. Presentation tonight we have Quinney Conservation Growth Plan to be presented by Mark Poo. Hi, Mark, you're going to be on speaker and on Zoom on the Township Council TV in front of us. Okay. Hi. Saying too much, but uh, you ready for for my presentation? Yep, and I've given you co-hosting ability, so if you'd like to share it, you're more than welcome to. Oh, okay, great. Thanks. That's a little, little different for me. Uh, I can't see anybody on the other end, so I'll just pretend that everybody's there. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me tonight to talk about the Android project. Very exciting project that started almost two years ago to the date. Uh, we had a big drought in 2016, and here at Wichita we, uh, we thought, you know, things could have been done better on how uh, drought is being addressed and uh, plans for and how we respond to drought. Um, so we, we applied for funding to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and were successful in getting a grant of $250,000 to do the drought project, which enables us to do a lot of great things. First off, we got to review the local water budget to see what the impacts of climate change might be on our local water balance and how that relates to drought. Uh, secondly, we were able to form a uh, drought steering committee or project committee and uh, basically got an amazing group of people. We had representatives from all the provincial agencies Two from the Ministry of Environment, Ontario Ministry of Culture and Food, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, a number of municipalities, uh, water uh, department operators, the planning director from Hastings County, the emergency management coordinator from Hastings County. Uh, your municipality was very well represented by uh, John Wise, representing municipal councils, and also. Um, Lawrence O'Keefe from the Friends of Napanee River represented the public interest groups. Uh, in addition, we had a representative from the Ontario Federation of Agriculture representing farmers, as well as the First Nations community. So I just put together uh, a little presentation, slide presentation to show you just some of the highlights of the program. It, as I mentioned, it was two years and uh, the drought plan itself was close to 200 pages. So uh, I'll try to do it justice in a short little presentation. I did send the, uh, the final plan out today to members of Kevin, to the uh, CAO at Stone Mills Township to distribute, and hopefully everybody has a chance to have a look at that plan. All right. Now, the one thing you'll notice here, uh, a little bit different from what I, the presentation I gave out there last Friday, the, the drought plan has moved from a draft to a final report. I did have some last minute comments from uh, one of the watershed members, uh, the First Nations community, uh, which I was able to include. And I think that was really great because this made this a complete plan. It is a regional plan. Um, Water does not follow political boundaries, so it is very important to be inclusive and include everybody in this plan because water is a shared resource and we all have to do our part. So Quinney Conservation has been involved in the Low Water Response Program for quite
quite some time. This is a program that was developed by the province. There are three different levels of drought, uh, level one, two, and three, one being the least severe and three being the most severe. Uh, we respond to those droughts by monitoring the levels of precipitation throughout the watershed. So a level one, when rainfall drops to less than 80%, and level three, very serious drought when it drops to less than 40% of normal conditions. So what we do to respond to drought is the first two levels to ask people to conserve and reduce their water use. Level three can result in uh, actually legislation to restrict water use. We've never had to do that here in the Quinney region yet, but it is a tool that's available. So just what about has happened over uh, the last 20 years since 2001, we have been administering the program. And here you have a chart showing the different levels of drought. Um, yellow is a level two, blue is a level one, red level three. As you can see, over half of the years that we've been administering this program, we've had low water conditions throughout the summer months. And the most severe being most recent in 2016, you can see it was a level three, was the longest duration, 30 weeks, a uh, very uh, long drought. We were afraid that year that the uh, ground was going to freeze before we got recharged our local aquifers. Uh, luckily enough, uh, we did get rain late November, topped up the aquifers before we got uh, frost in the ground. And then here on the uh, right hand side, you can see the last three consecutive summers have been level two droughts, quite severe. What are we learning from those droughts? Well, some of the impacts were, we have observed in 2016, uh, it was hard to get a read on how many wells, how many people's wells actually went dry. So we looked at a surrogate way of determining the impact on private wells, and that was looking at bulk water sales from the different bulk water stations around the region. Here we have a bar chart for the Napanee bulk water station. You see 2015, there was no low water, so that's kind of a base year as, as well as 2017. 2016, huge spike, 70% increase in bulk water sales. And then again, 2018 and 2019, you can see we had low level two low water conditions, again, increase in bulk water sales. So big uh, economic cost to people on wells to purchase that water. Um, I've estimated the value here, $125,000 just to purchase the water. That doesn't include delivery to people's homes or or their time and labor required to go and get the water. Some of the results observed around the watershed actually worse than the Napanee area, Prince Edward County, 2016, Mark, and we saw 100% increase in bulk water sales. Mark, can we interrupt you for one second? Um, for sure. Are you screen sharing? Because we're not seeing anything. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> okay. I am sorry for that. Yeah, thanks for interrupting me. I wonder why that's not showing up. Yeah. Let me try it again. Yeah. I should have asked. No problem. I can I can change it to on my end. Maybe you've got to be a host. Uh, I'm trying it here again. Do you guys see anything? No. Technology, eh? You had a report? Everybody's got it. Yeah, it's the same handouts. Um, there's only one slide that's different, that's at the end. So let me try this one more time. Oh, that's too bad. See anything? No. Okay. Well, um, I would send you what to do. I can try to be more descriptive than trying to refer to the uh, slides. Okay, Mark, what I'll do is I'll click open on ours, and you can tell me what slide you're on, I will slide down to it. Okay. Just a second here. Are you seeing this now? Yes, we are. Okay. There we go. 
That was uh, an error on my end. Apologize. There you go. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're on this slide here talking about the bulk water sales. Uh, hopefully, everybody was able to follow along in the handout, but it just demonstrated how the increase in bulk water sales in 2016 was observed at the Napanee Bulk Water Station, and similar trends throughout the watershed actually worse in Prince Edward County. Um, again, here on the right hand side, uh, level two low water conditions that summer. Not as much of an increase, but definitely an impact over uh, our 2015 and 2017, which were not low water years. All right, we'll go to the next slide about the agricultural impacts. So our way of trying to uh, put a, a picture or a handle on what the impacts to agriculture were, there were huge impacts from 2016 on agriculture. And the way we estimated those impacts was getting uh, insurance claim records from Agricor. That's the association that um, covers crop insurance for farmers. So this is just a reflection of crop insurance claims for those farmers that had crop insurance. Now there's many out there that don't. So in 2016, here on the right hand side, uh, we have bars for Frognac, Lennox and Addington, Hastings and Prince Edward, yellow being Lennox and Addington. You can see over a non-low water year, huge number of claims, close to 600 claims in 2016 versus a handful in 2017 and a little bit higher in 2018 as that was another low water year. Uh, during 2016, it was an $18 million impact for these four counties. Well, 20% of that claims came from Lennox and Addington County, which added up to around $4 million. So definitely a big impact. Ecological impacts, huge as well. Um, Springside Dam down in Napanee on the Napanee River. You can see a typical spring, tons of water flowing over the falls there. July of 2016, barely a trickle of flow. Hard on our local wildlife habitat and fish. Uh, in addition, many people do rely on the local streams and rivers for backup water sources. Those sources dried up, but any uh, you know takings during that time added to the ecological impact. So not a good situation in, in 2016 at all. So you might ask, is our climate changing? Well, we're quite fortunate to have a very good climate station in Belleville, um, where we have climate records dating back to 1920. So here you can see on this graph, the blue dots are annual average temperatures from 1920 to 2020. What we've seen is our temperatures have warmed by almost two degrees to an annual average of eight degrees. So that's uh, all the pluses and minus averaged over the course of the year. Uh, the, there are global climate models that have projected what our future temperatures are going to look like. And you can see here on this graph, the red line is a high emission scenario. So by high emissions, they're talking about carbon. And uh, if we don't change our ways and continue burning carbon the way we do now, this is the anticipated increase in temperature, uh, a total of six degrees warming, at the end of 2100 up to 14 degrees would be our annual average. However, there is hope if we can change our ways, uh, we can reduce this impact. If we have less reliance on fossil fuels, uh, still uh, a three degree increase, but to an annual average of 11 degrees, which sounds a lot better than 14. There is hope if we can change our ways. So you might be asking, well, how does that impact on our local water budget? Well, we've done a lot of work on the water budgets in the Quinney region. Every year, this area receives well, three, three feet or one meter of precipitation. That's snow and rain combined. Two thirds of that water is lost to evaporation and transpiration and that occurs over the warmer summer months. So you might guess if the temperature is going to increase, then we are going to see increased amounts of evaporation and transpiration. So the work that we've done is predicted that we could see a 10% increase in evaporation and transpiration. Uh, precipitation is predicted long-term to stay about the same, which is a very good thing. However, with 10% increase means less water available for recharge to our groundwater and runoff to our streams and rivers. The other side uh, of this uh, projected changes are warmer winters, which is great. However, it does have an impact 
on the snowpack. So we see more winter rain and less snow. Uh, snow is a very good way of storing the water to later in the year and releasing it when we need that water, so closer to the growing season. So with less of a snowpack and warmer temperatures, we can see a definite impact on our water cycle. So it is time to plan right now. Um, so we have come up with the, the drought management plan as a way of trying to help watershed residents adapt to climate change. There are a number of very important things in that plan which outline the duties and responsibilities of all the different agencies that are involved in drought response including municipalities and Quinney Conservation. Uh, the plan includes an overview of indicators of drought, so we don't plan on changing any of those indicators from what we saw, what you saw on the earlier uh, slide that I showed. However, we, we have uh, added a very important um, component, and that's uh, a normal condition. So we have level one, two, and three, but right now there is no normal condition. So that has been a condition that's added to the drought indicator program and a whole list of actions for people, for municipalities and the conservation authority to undertake to try to get people to prepare to deal with drought. Uh, steps in preparing for drought, uh, we've identified water use priorities, so we're in the middle of a low water conditions. If it gets to the state where we have to restrict water, what are the priorities of water use? emergency planning and how to declare a state of emergency uh, relating to drought and identification of backup water supplies which municipalities will be responsible to do and most importantly development of an education and communications plan on how droughts are communicated as well as information to help watershed residents uh, prepare for droughts by starting to conserve water and, and other ways to, to use water more wisely. Part of the project is we did look at the sensitivity of drought throughout the Quinney Regional Watershed. So this map here on the left, you can see all the municipalities. We had two uh, factors that we considered in developing this map. One was uh, how vulnerable the groundwater is to drought. So we scored each um, municipality based on groundwater conditions on how susceptible they were to drought. And then the second factor, being the reliance on groundwater. So some municipalities within the Quinney region, such as Stone Mills, are 100% reliant on groundwater for their water supply, whereas other municipalities like Belleville and some of them in Prince Edward County uh, <clears throat> rely on surface water supplies. So their exposure is less so than municipalities are 100% are reliant. So the red areas being high uh, drug impact risk, so you can see even Prince Edward County relying on surface water as a significant population relying on private wells that are susceptible to drought. And stone mills also a high impact area. And here's the uh, drought indicators that I just previously mentioned about adding uh, the low uh, normal conditions when it's time to plan and prepare for a drought rather than waiting for a drought to occur and to react to it. That's been the program that we've been administering to date, but it's much better to prepare for drought ahead of time and uh, the impacts be less severe. So one of the easiest ways to deal with drought is to conserve water. And there's many, many, many different ways that people can conserve water. It, it all it relates to is changing our ways. So by adapting to climate change, we adapt the ways we use water, we use it more wisely, more efficiently, there's various uh, products now available to help conserve water. One that I really like is uh, gray water recycling. These are units that are available commercially. It will take your shower and your sink water, store it in a tank, treat it, and then use it to flush your toilets. So if you look at the daily household water use, um, showers and sinks can make up a third of a total uh, water consumption of a, of a home. Uh, and toilet flushing can also make up a third. So if you take that water from your showers, use it to flush the toilet, you can reduce your daily water demand by a third. Very uh, easy way to, to cut down on your daily water demand. Alternate water supplies. Many uh, people have to turn to alternate water supplies during droughts, hence the, the bulk water sales records. But 
what happened in 2016, we observed a lot of people uh, weren't prepared. They didn't have a means of storing the water and also didn't, hadn't identified sources of where the water is going to come from. So very important to do this ahead of time prior to the drought to make sure you have an adequate means at households to store water as well as a source, whether that be uh, you know, a municipal bulk filling station or if there's a large reservoir that can be used. Um, keep in mind that I had mentioned earlier, ecological impacts on our local streams and river are, are significant during droughts. So additional pressure from people taking water from those sources, it is not good. Um, also I want to remind fire protection is very important during droughts. Reservoirs are normally relied on being dried up and uh, yeah, fire uh, departments will have to look where they're going to get the water during a severe drought. Future development is another way or another thing that needs to be considered when planning for drought. Uh, just timely with the preparation of the drought plan was the provincial policy statement 2020 was issued and that plan uh, was very good at promoting uh, municipalities to consider new development that's only approved where it's sustainable in regards to the impacts from climate change, promotes water use efficiency and uh, water conservation. So definitely this is something that needs to be considered when planning for future development. Uh, when you're relying on private wells, studies need to be done to make sure there's enough water available, not only for the proposed development, but the existing people that live there. Uh, there's many ways other municipalities uh, have started to implement things like this. Uh, I looked at the city of Guelph, which is one of the largest municipalities in Canada that relies 100% on groundwater for their water supply. So it is a finite resource for them and they are growing and expanding, but they have to use the water more efficiently. So there's an, actually a, a program they have in the city of Guelph, it's called Blue Built Homes where these homes have to meet certain standards for using water more wisely. And that way, when they uh, use water more wisely, it can accommodate more development with the same amount of water. Uh, something else I should mention here is, uh, coincidentally, the same time as the provincial policy statement and the drought plan is the province of Ontario did a review of their large water taking program. And they actually did a study looking at uh, water quantity throughout the province. Quinney region was identified as an area that's sensitive to drought and I can't uh, verify the, the claims but they are indicating in their study that the uh, long-term sustainability of our water resources is not there when it comes to considering the impacts of climate change. So not good news, they are coming out with uh, new requirements for the permit to take water program I don't know what they are yet, but stay tuned and, and watch for those. You can make public comments on them uh, to see what they are as it pertains to our municipality. Uh, in addition to all that work on the drought plan and the water budgets, we have been able to upgrade our monitoring program. So Pony Conservation has a large network of rain gauges, groundwater monitoring wells, stream survey gauges, Snow, soil uh, moisture probes, snow depth sensors, snow course surveys, all kinds of monitoring we do to help us uh, uh, manage our water resource. Some of the things that we've done is we've been able to add 10 lake level monitoring gauges. So we have uh, one on Beaver Lake, which is in Snow Mills Township, as well as some others on the Salmon and the Napanee River system upgrading of Stone Mills, so the Deeper Lakes area as well as up on Big Clear Lake. These gauges automatically record water levels and report that information on our website so it's shared with the public. But what it does is it helps us remotely monitor the lake levels and helps us manage that water resource. So you recall the slide with the uh, water at Springside Dam and the, in the spring of the year versus the middle of the summer, if we can manage that water resource a little bit better, and we have uh, done some work on developing a watershed model to help us uh, determine when to hold back water and when to release it to try to lessen the impacts of drought during a dry summer. The other uh, bright light is we've been able to start engaging citizen scientists. So with the weird weather patterns that we've been having, 
it's very hard to have rain gauges everywhere to figure out where it rained and, and where it didn't. Uh, big shout out to the Friends of Napanee River group who helped support this through mm -hmm. one of their winter speaker series um, uh, presentation that was provided. Uh, a number of people have signed up to participate in the program and they're just waiting on me. I have uh, purchased some new rain gauges uh, sitting in my office at work and I just have to get them sent out to people with a definite big help to engage citizen scientists, help us monitor the rainfall patterns. And with that, thank you very much. Um, the drought plan, I think, is a good resource for your municipality. Um, all the work's not done, as I mentioned. There still is a uh, need to prepare for the next drought, as well as to do things like incorporate uh, some of the things that I talked about that are in the plan in your official plan. I think it will be a very good resource for your municipality in providing the background information about the water conditions in the Quinney region. So although I can't see anybody, but if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Good job. Yeah, can, can you hear me, Mark? Yeah, hi, John. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm wondering about uh, uh, development in stone mills, and maybe Jason can chime in here. Um, do we have areas now that um, if there's a, um, a new bill proposed on them that we automatically ask for a hydro G study, and if so, would you be involved in commenting on that, or how, how would that work between the you and, and Stone Mills? So, um, yeah, I have I work with Stone Mills, as you know, and I think Jason is doing a really good job at flagging when hydro G studies uh, should be requested because he usually asks for comments, and and there is a bit of a protocol to go through, which is listed in the drought plan. Um, a lot of it has to do with lot density, so where areas are getting built up through the consent process or it's an existing hamlet, or even an area that's a known constraint, uh, that would be a time to request a, a hydrogen study to make sure there's enough water available. So I have provided some background in the drought plan that could be a good resource for your municipality to refer to. So yeah, definitely, uh, uh, a good point, John. And I have worked with Jason on a number of these, and yeah, you guys, are, I think, are doing a pretty good job at when to request these studies. Yeah. Very good work. That, thanks, Mark. It's Jason Sands speaking. Um, the only thing I'd add to that further uh, that we've mentioned, and many of us in this room are aware, we're undergoing the official plan update currently, and with the work that Mark has already completed on the draft on the drought plan. Um, we look to build that language in our consent policies of Section 5, 755 that currently lack that uh, policy direction on when or what tipping point we would request such a study. Um, Mark will attest to, the, to the, the points in which we use now may be lended or pulled from other areas or other legislation that are sort of best practices around our area of, this, uh, of the country. So we're looking to build that um, more robust language and clear direction from a policy perspective into our plan, which would augment that of, of the drought plan. For sure. Now the guidelines that we use are to review these studies are from the Ministry of Environment and they are from the 1990s. So the, the province has kind of promised for the last five or 10 years that they're going to update these guidelines, but have yet to see them. And a lot of municipalities have uh, chosen not to wait any longer and have started to develop their own. Uh, so uh, definitely some work to do on uh, keeping things up to date, especially with the way our climate is, is changing. I could mention one other thing too. Um, the other important thing about you know managing groundwater in municipality is monitoring. So Quinney Conservation does participate in the Provincial Groundwater Monitoring Network as partners with the province of Ontario. Uh, we have 29 wells through the watershed and uh, three of them were in Stone Mills Township. Unfortunately, two of those wells were on private properties and uh, property ownership did change hands and the new owners didn't want to participate in the program. So that leaves us with one monitor well in Stone Mills Township. 
And I, and I think it would present an opportunity if the municipality is interested to work with Quinney Conservation on trying to get the number of modern wells back up uh, in the municipality if you have properties. Now, the one well we do uh, use is actually on municipal property, and that is the best plan so we can avoid uh, having to lose some of our monitor wells when properties change hands and, and the new person isn't interested in, in doing that monitoring. So I just want to extend that offer out to the municipality. If there is any interest, uh, definitely we'll, would be happy to work with you on trying to uh, get our numbers back up in, in Stone Mills Township. Okay, with that being said, Doug, David, do you have something to say? Yeah, Mark, just a question to follow up on that, uh, the monitor wells. Do you need anything special for that? And what I'm thinking of is, I mean, we have fire halls all over the four fire halls. We have property all over the township. What, is there something that is onerous in this or what? No, no, not really. Uh, like we do have uh, the equipment that was pulled out of, uh, we had a well, we lost a well in Newburg. I still have that equipment. Uh, I had a possibility of getting another well in Newburgh, but again, it was on private property, so I'm a little reluctant. But uh, what it requires us is to go out and do an evaluation on the well to see if it's suitable, if there is an existing well on the property. Uh, if there isn't, then, um, you know, we're a little strapped on money, so we don't have the, the funds to install new wells, but I could go back to the, the province and uh, find out if there's any funding to install a new well, or if it's something the municipality is interested in because you are so reliant on groundwater, um, we could we could look at getting a new well installed. But it, it does require a bit of an evaluation. So if you had candidate properties, you definitely would go out and visit them and, and choose a good spot where we're trying to monitor ambient groundwater conditions. So we're not necessarily looking to monitor impacts, we're looking to monitor ambient groundwater conditions. Uh, and so the reason I question that is, I mean, we have a fire hall in Newburgh, one in Yarker, one in Enterprise, and one in Tamworth. I mean, that would give you a pretty widespread area. And if it's something that would Im wouldn't impact the use of the well, I, I mean, I think we would, I would think we should consider using those wells. No, I, I definitely recommend it. It's, uh, it's definitely worth having that data because if you don't collect it now, uh, 20 years down the road, uh, we won't have anything to compare to to say, yeah, this this was what the conditions were at that time, or to give us some warning that, hey, yeah, our, our aquifer levels are falling, falling, and that uh, we need to be doing things differently. So definitely uh, worth having that data. And I should mention the Tamworth well is near the the fire hall. It's actually in the field out behind the grocery store at Tamworth, and and that well I will mention too is one of the best wells uh, I think we have in the whole program. Is somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 gallons per minute. So water quantity wise, uh, definitely worth uh, something looking into. You, you may, uh, you know, make a double advantage of this program by doing a little bit of exploration to see what type of resources are out there for, for you guys to use for, for future development. Any more questions for anybody? Yeah. Go ahead, John. Yeah, this is maybe more for uh, for Jake. Um, and Mark referred to the uh, gray water recycling and reuse systems. Have you seen anyone apply for that? And, and what does the building code say about that kind of thing? Yeah, um, I when I was in Algonquin College, uh, they were using it for their brand new LEED certified building. Um, we're not seeing anything like that locally in houses. Um, nobody's recycling water. Um, they're big on it in, in places like Australia where they've dealt with water problems for, for generations. Um, the building code um, has written all sorts of uh, you know, uh, futuristic uh, uh, water saving abilities into it. I mean, it's not the building code's fault. Uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, could be done, it's just that nobody's investing in it. Um, basically, I mean, the building code has tried to, uh, for instance, you know, make mandatory low flow toilets, that sort of thing. Um, but it's, it's uh, 
what what are you describing in terms of water recycling? You're not seeing locally with two houses going here. It would be a good thing to promote if, uh, if there's literature available that uh, maybe uh, get it distributed to uh, plumbers and builders. People probably don't even think about it. Thank you. Any other questions from anybody? I see none because Mark, but we said here, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. Do you have someone? Yeah, just on, on John's last comment, so could we direct Jake then to um, provide or gather some educational material that can be distributed to builders and uh, what was the other one, just plumbers? plumbers? Oh, I know a few of those. Yeah, I imagine. Any other questions coming? Mark, thank you very much. The reading has just passed on. Okay, sorry, I, I'm having problems hearing on this, and some people, yeah, well, nobody was actually extra clear other than yourself, so yeah, sorry, thanks for, for having me, was there, I didn't hear if there was any discussion, there, so I don't know if there's anything further that I need to do or provide to the municipality, but if so, uh, please direct it to, through um, Brian or Jason, and I'll get to it and get back to you. Thanks for allowing me to come tonight. Thank you. Good, take care. Should we, should we move forward now, Christina? Yes. Yeah. Wait, but... yeah, I just like to propose I ask if what council thinks about the other three fire homes that are making the offer to market. Uh, to uh, uh, look at the Arthur Enterprise and Newburgh uh, to see if they're acceptable wells that you can use. If it's no harm to us, the information that I, I make a motion. Thank you. Motion by uh, Doug, seconded by John. Any questions or comments on that motion? Go ahead, Kevin. Just a question. I want to, are they looking for wells that people are using? He didn't really say so. No, I, and I should have asked him actually, yes. but. Like, I have a property with wells just sitting there. I wouldn't mind if they monitored it. I would expect, I mean, it depends on whether we just need the groundwater level or whether level including usage. Yeah, that's what I should have asked. Hey, sort of what I got from that, I could be wrong, but he was looking at some wells 20 years old, and I think on private property, the land changes, changes and uh, people don't want to do it. So I think you're mm -hmm. going to go that camera. I just, you know, I got a lot of from this property. The thing that I see about Three fire halls is they're all in downtown villages, which are in the river valleys. So, you know, with small lots, heavy usage around them, might be a great place to do it. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. All in favor of the motion? Here. So, any other, nothing else on that? I'm going to ask council motion received. Uh, delegation for the presentation from Mark Rule for any conservation for the drought plan and the testify of life. And further, the council direct manager to post this plan on the township website for the community education and information. So, the firm mover moved by Debbie, second by Sherry. Any questions, comments? All in favor of motion? Motion carried. Okay, we were bylaws and resolution. Bylaws and resolution. A bylaw 2021 being a bylaw to appoint party building inspector on the building code for the permit support. No, yeah, so, so with the recent changeover um, uh, from KFL and A to Stone Mills doing uh, Part 8 or septic system permits, um, there's a need. Right now, I'm the only one in Stone Mills Township that has the ability. Um, it's always great for you know, emergency and success in planning to have a backup in case uh, I break my leg tomorrow. Um, in this case, uh, in Napanee, this is uh, Andrew Girard. He's a longtime uh, KFLNA employee and, and locally for Stone Mills Township. Um, he is now a, a, an employee of Napanee and is doing all of their uh, septic uh, permitting and inspections. And this is just uh, including him in a, in a shared services program so that uh, if I go on holidays or whatever, then, then 
while we're we're still uh, getting somebody in place uh, other than me locally in Stone Mills, that, that he can also do those inspections and issue those permits. Any questions for Jake? Go ahead, Jake. Or, um, sorry, Kevin. How does that work, Jake? Do, do we pay him or does it just work back and forth or how? I just wondered how it worked. Yeah, so um, how it's been working lately is that I go in there, they pay me, and they come out here, I pay them. It, it's not a lot of, I haven't done many inspections in that many recently, and they haven't really done any inspections uh, much here. Yeah, money in, money out. Okay, great. Thank you. Go ahead, Doug. Top move. For second, third reading, Council. Yeah. Moved by Council Davis, a second by Wenda. All in favor of the motion? Motion is carried. Just okay. There is an intent that that bylaw would actually become cost neutral once Napoli and Stone Mills get the full complement of their staff. There is a hope that we would stop transferring service fees back and forth, but as, as long as this agreement's been in place, one or the other municipality has been now at full complement, so the payment arrangement has stayed in place. We'll go to the financial accounts. Any questions for Christina? Christina, you got anything to report? Oh. Sorry, I missed one. Okay. Sorry, I jumped the gun on there. <laughs> no, <I'm sorry. laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, although this falls under my my heading, it's really uh, many of us here say old trucks and uh, public works may possibly be able to assist in, in, in overview on this. But uh, just quickly, in 2001, the Township of Stone Mills entered into an agreement uh, and bylaw binding with Union Gas. Uh, that was for a 20 year span. So we're, we're due on 2021 now. So the, the, that agreement through bylaw uh, has lapsed. Um, essentially, the franchise agreement allows for uh, the distribution, storage, transmission of gas on our municipal road allowances uh, coming out to the Trap Corner Newburgh uh, area on along Thunder Road 1. Um, the request put forward by by Enbridge is that uh, readings first and second uh, be passed uh, in, a, in a council meeting for, for their consideration. Taking that back um, in in the Enbridge world to the um, Ontario Energy Board, which to show the support of their local municipalities to agree and, and enter into a continued agreement, um, and then back in front of. The, the municipality and the council thereof for third reading. That, uh, if you're reviewing what was done in 2001, it was the same form. Uh, in that there was a two month delay. If you're wondering why, that, that's why there's a two month delay between um, first, second, and third readings at, at, at that time. So um, that's just a, a brief update, but uh, it's essentially a continuation for uh, an additional couple decades. So what we've already had in 2010. Thank you. Go ahead, Kevin. Jason, was there any uh, speculation or any talk about expansion uh, for the gas works throughout the community at all? Or, uh, <laughs> I guess it goes to Jeff. <laughs> the fact of, oh, I'll try to answer that, Councilor Richmond. In the 2018, there was an intake for interested municipalities that were interested in broadening their service areas. Um, the initial discussions that we had were to try to determine whether there'd be any interest in moving the gas lines on through to the village of Canada East. And at that time, the original discussions stopped because the cost was to be borne by the municipality to get the pipes from the end of their current service lines to the starting of the village of Canada East. And then they would consider extending throughout the village. So. The cost to extend the distance between with um, well one limited resources and two minimal recovery for the municipality was was almost a non-starter. So um, it, it's it's astronomical 
um, the cost from Newburgh to Camden News. I think at the time it was well into the double digits of millions just to get the service lines so that they could pick up to offer Camden News. So it, it didn't go any further from that part. Go ahead, John. The other thing we have to think about now is uh, stranded assets because supposedly by 2050, we're not going to be burning that thing or oil or coal. So how much do we invest in, in infrastructure for something that we're trying to get out of? Go ahead, Jake. Yeah, just to echo those comments, John, I sat a lot, of, a lot I went to conferences in, in the era of, of Kathleen Wynne being our premier. And, and at that time, the Liberal government here in Ontario had a lot of policies uh, looking forward. And they proposed in their forecasting um, and tightening up the building code and, and decreasing our needs for, for use of fossil fuels, that they had it written in the agenda that by 2030, they would outlaw all new houses being built from being able to hook up to natural gas or any other fossil fuel. So, uh, 2030 really isn't that far away. So, and, and I know that they're not in power right now, but I mean, the wheels of the government, the wheels of governments, uh, um, you know, those thoughts are still out there, and they may someday be in power again. Uh, Any more? Go ahead, Doug. Uh, yeah, back in 2020, when they first came in here, I mean, they came to Strathcona simply because of the volume of use at the paper mill. And then they came to Newburgh simply because of the volume of use at Tempers. And once they were there, then they just took it. But they, unfortunately, with cursed light, uh, the lightning stone substrate we got here, putting gas lines in this country is just ridiculous price uh, in rock. Uh, I, I would say it this way we were fortunate to have them come. 2000 and uh, to service the area of the Indian service. And in fact, to be quite honest, I have never heard of any other gas company knocking on the door trying to get it. So I think we just agreed to just keep on doing business with what the people have done until there's no more business. That's the way it is. And I would move for a second. So by first, second, second there. Sherry, any more questions, comments? All in favor of motion? Motion is carried. That would go to the the comments. The report in front of you tonight is for the January 2020 accounts payable that has been issued. Some of those invoices you will see are for 2019 of December, and then some of them are for 2020 of January. Any questions for Christina? <laughs> Moved by Kevin, second by John. All in favor of the motion? Carry. Thank you. We now to Chief Building Official Dettler, Stone Mills Recreation Center, Engineering Design, RFQ Services. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, so we, we did a first round and things didn't come back so well. Um, so I reached out and, and talked to the officials that I that I spoke with, and I've come with a series of recommendations on, on uh, how to move forward to try to get um, us some cheaper prices so that we can get this construction project off the ground. And um, in this report, I wrote that uh, um, it won't be cheaper to change it, but it would probably, from what I'm hearing from all of the industry officials that, that want to do these drawings, they would rather that we do it the right way by, by starting fresh with the new slab and ripping out the old concrete, putting in new concrete, putting in new foam, and, and if there needs to be some sand brought in, then, then doing that as well. Uh, the second thing is um, I'm hearing from the industry officials um, uh, that they're extremely busy and they're writing overtime prices into some of this. So um, um, the next RFQ will go out and will be sent out to uh, many more companies and we'll try to find one with experience that, that doesn't feel like it has to pay overtime to get this job done. So, um, I was hope, hoping, does anybody have any questions on that? Okay, we'll start with John and then we'll go to Yeah, Jake, uh, is, the, uh, is the grant money we're getting limited to 2021? We can't carry over into 
do the project next year if we can't get a decent quote on design? Yeah, I, I think we could reach out and ask. Our schedule right now is to do it this summer. Um, but uh, as we found out last year, we were hoping to do some of the work last year and that, uh, that didn't happen and it was it was carried over, um, with, especially with COVID in the background of everything. Um, I think ideally I'd like to get it done this year though. So I'd like to I'd I'd like to try. So. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah. My question's along the same line, if it's possible to extend it another year. I mean, to be quite honest with you, uh, there's a, a quite a number of arenas that also got this grant that are doing this work this year as you just expanded on. And that allows or leads these companies to um, be, um, their pen is pretty soft when they're writing their orders and the prices get extended quite a bit. Uh, feast or famine, if there's no work next year, they'll be more willing for a little a more agreeable. So, I mean, I would at least reach out and ask, can, can we last one more year? And if we can, you might find it beneficial to wait one year. I find out that the grant money is movable first, you know. What well, and I would write the, uh, the request here so that you don't have to accept it. I guess the, the only question is then we could get it all done and scheduled for next year. Um, the only thing is, is there a lot of people that are planning on doing and spending their grant money next year? That's the only thing we don't know because you're right. This was a cultural grant that kind of specifically wanted the money to go into recreation. And unfortunately, for a lot of municipalities, that means pools and, and, and you know, recreation arenas, gymnasiums, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I mean, there could be a lot of work to do next year through the same grant program. I, I'm just not sure. If, if council wants us to look into that, I, I would rather try to do it this year. Uh, would you guys like me to get pricing? And then if the pricing is adequate, I'll bring it back to council, then you can make the decision on that at that point. That's probably makes me back with some pricing and see how we look at it. And looking at that floor in there, for one, like, as we say, it worked like you walk around, it's been nice, but it's been there a long time. You know, I mean, I just hate to lose a season and something happens. Do you have something, Kevin? Well, I was just going to ask Jake if you can get the prices and could you check and see if they can, if we can move it to next year, the grant as well. Yeah, I could I could ask that question. Yeah. And both yeah, we send it back out and uh but yeah, send it back out and see what you get for price. Go ahead, Brenda. Just a quick question. Uh when you were trying to uh solicit these um uh, quotes and ideas from different vendors, um initially it was just resurfacing and then it came back to basic. Oh no, it would be much better to rip it out and do it all over again. Do you have a sense that they're, um, I, I want to say reluctant uh, to uh, get the job done without having a lot of overtime might have been due to the fact that they really didn't want to bid on just resurfacing, that they were more interested in, in the full job, which at that time wasn't really on the table. It just sort of came about through your discussion with them. Like, would, would that sweeten the pot at all if we were to say, yeah, we want you to do the 1.2 million instead of the uh, 200,000 job? Yeah, no, they were more interested in, in pricing it lower if we did the job without a lot of question marks, which would be to, to rip it out and start over. Um, when you're trying to overpour, which was what my, my original plan was. Um, there's a lot of questions about, um, you know, the cracking that could happen and, and two surfaces trying to, to be over top of, you know, uh, especially when you have a lot of freeze and thaw going on. Um, you know, in hindsight, I don't think it was a great idea. And I do agree with the official that I've talked to more recently on this. Yeah, I'm not a refrigeration expert, but I, I didn't, the, the overpour wasn't from those three industry um, that were that were quoting on this on this request for quote. Uh, that came from elsewhere. And uh, these three officials said that, that if you could 
I mean, another thing to look at is that we're going to move the slab a little bit. The corners of the, the current arena, the corners of the boards are a little bit sharper than the industry um, new arenas that we're, we're building today. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but when Al drives or, or one of our arena attendants drives the Zamboni around, it's not a really smooth corner. They got to kind of take a sharp right turn at every corner. Um, um, the new arena will be a much more, and it'll make for better ice, less uh, humps on each corner. Um, and so when you're trying to overpour, if you're trying to move uh, the corners here and there, um, it was going to be uh, a, a huge task and, and probably not something we want to be getting to. And, and you might end up creating a mess one, one day. Any more questions for Drake? If not, I'd like a motion to receive the report. Moved by Kevin. Second by Jimmy. All in favor? Carried. Yeah. New business statements for members? Well, nobody's got some. I got a couple things here I just want to pass on. Back a while ago, I got a phone call from the director of education for the Lionsville School Board. And we, we had a bit of an interview with him just talked. And he just gave me some numbers here. And anyway, I asked him what schools go to. He said, no, that's not going to happen. But, and uh, he just says they give me some numbers of the students. There's 120 students in Enterprise, 120 in Centerville, 130 in Newburgh. Excuse me, 125 in Taylor. The 65 of those kids, they um, are doing Zoom from home. So they are sitting right now with some classroom and venting. But anyway, they're just hoping that uh, when it gets going back, you'll be moving on with that. And uh, anyway, and another that, for that. And I received an email request from Neil Hugham, C H O U G H A M, from Bell Canada. And uh, he wanted to let her support the bus for the things we did come to council make down in the ground or something. So anyway, that was sent for the people branch. And one other thing, <clears throat> through the county, I listened to a seminar by Kevin Lyons. The topic was public input. I don't know anybody here got on that. But anyway, it, it's something I think everybody around here should listen to. It. It was very helpful. It says what's dangerous and what's the most useful. It was really interesting. And you send out a presentation email. It's hoped a group of people come in here and fill this hall of 30 people. And council makes the decision, boy, we've got a quite a turnout here. That's sort of going to that interest. Well, we're breaking it down instead of, okay, let's go and talk to the other thousand people. And it's, it's a very, very interesting um, um, presentation there. So I, Ryan's got it there. It's just something I think that, uh, you know, we dealt with water pasture, we dealt with um, the big farm, we dealt with uh, solar. solar. But anyway, it just puts a whole view on it, and I think it's just something all council members should, should listen to. But anyway, Ryan does the email there, but anyway, just pass that on for you. So I have anything else? Go ahead, John. Yes, thanks. Uh, at our budget meeting, there was some question uh, as to whether Quinn Conservation might have additional uh, requests this year. So I got in touch with uh, Christine McClure, our uh, water resources manager, and, uh, and Brad McNevin, CEO. Um, that 13 Island Lake Dam that I mentioned, that project is scheduled for, for next year. Um, but they would like to get the design in place for this year. They don't have a, a price yet. They're hoping to have a price uh, this month. Christine says she doesn't think it will be more than $105,000. Um, that's not for us, that's total. Um, if we get the WECI funding, that's the, that's the water um, erosion control infrastructure uh, funding, that's a 50% grant. That would knock it down to 50,000. Our share uh, of that uh, might be about um, 20%. So we could be looking at five to $10,000 uh, additional requests from, from the CA. But I think if we don't get the wacky funding, then that will put that project on hold anyway. But I was thinking, Christina, maybe uh, on that budget line, you might just stick in a contingency of like 7,500 bucks or something like that. And we should know within a month um, what that exact figure will be. Thank you. Thanks, John. Anybody else got anything? Okay, with that meeting said, we will go to the confirming. 
We're going to confirm by a uh, by Doug, by Debbie. All in favor? Carried. Motion to adjourn. Doug, carried. All in favor?